This is the final part of the presentation I've been giving showing how the first two pages of the sonnets are encrypted. Um, you'll remember uh, the most important thing really is the key which is telling you three times three everything must happen in threes and if you've been watching attentively to the previous part you'll feel a little bit short-changed um, because I haven't been following the key, or I have been following the key, but um, T, 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 Clavis had the key to the treasury, key to the treasures, has to come in threes. So nothing really can be validated until the key has been turned three times and then we can open the door. And of course, as you know, I've shown you one encryption that was on the sonnet's title page there, where I showed you the hidden geometry and how it led to the exact spot where Edward de Vere lies buried. And it told us um, twice on there that Edward de Vere was the author of those sonnets. Um, I also showed you another encryption on the second page where we laid out that uh, text into a grid of 18, 19 letters across. And we saw that Edward de Vere was buried in Poet's Corner in Westminster Abbey. So between those two, we found the exact spot and place where he was buried. But that was only two encryptions, and we need to see a third. Everything has to come in threes. So now I'm going to show you the third encryption. And first of all, a little bit of background to what it's about. Um, to the only begetter of these ensuing sonnets, Mr. W.H., that's how the mystical um, dedication begins. Um, Mr. W.H., quite a lot of arguments about who that is. Um, clearly from this sentence, if it can be understood at all, the only begetter and Mr. W.H. are one and the same, the same person. Um, if you read the first uh, 18 sonnets, um, it's pretty obvious that there's only one person who does any begetting in the sonnets, and he's generally known as the fair youth. He's not named in the sonnets, but he's the person who the poet addresses, and the poet writes 17 sonnets on the trot, saying, I have a baby for love of me, and the 18th sonnet seems to imply that he's had a baby. Um, and so he's the fair youth, and most scholars will agree uh, that the fair youth is Henry Rothersley, uh, third Earl of Southampton, who was a, a quite a pretty boy of 19 uh, when these, also around that age, when these sonnets were addressed to him. Um, we now know that the poet, Shake-Spear, is Edward de Vere. That's, I think, been proved by the, um, by the stuff I've shown you on the previous encryptions. So, the first 17 sonnets, Edward de Vere writes to Henry Rothersley, saying, have a baby, have a baby, have a baby, 17 times. They're known as the procreation sonnets. 17 times, going over and over and over the same argument, really. He says... Uh, to the um, fair youth, who is a, a narcissist. How do you get a narcissist to do anything? Um, you tell them you'll take their beauty away if they don't do it, and they jolly well snap too. So Shakespeare says 17 times, your beauty will die if you don't procreate, if you don't have a son. Um, and among the arguments he uses, he says, um, your summer will be cut short by ragged winter if you don't have this baby. Um, the winter summer... Um, idea is given a number of times actually in the first 17 sonnets and he also says if you do go the length of having a son for the love of me um, that would be nice and you will grow and live in it and in my rhyme so that's the theme of the first 17 sonnets and then we get to sonnet 18 and in sonnet 18 uh, Edward de Vere says to him thy eternal summer shall not fade well We've just been told that his summer will be cut short by ragged winter if he doesn't have a baby. So now we're being told his summer shall not fade. It rather implies that the baby has been born. The scheme has worked. Honey-tongued Shakespeare has managed to persuade this narcissistic fair youth to do his bidding. We also learn in son Sonnet 18, In eternal lines to time thou growest. Well, we were told that uh, if he had a baby, he will grow and live in it and in my rhyme. And now... That seems to be what's going to happen in eternal lines to time thou growest. Um, so a lot, number of Oxfordian scholars are working on finding a lot of interesting stuff to show that the um, ensuing son was no known son of uh, Henry Rothersley. So he didn't actually marry till some time later anyway. So who could the son be? And it's being suggested that he was 
Henry, the 18th Earl of Oxford, Henry Vere. So we have a situation in which the 17th Earl of Oxford is persuading uh, the Earl of Southampton to beget a son for love of him that he can then, if you like, adopt or, or secretly claim to be his own son and bring him up as a Vere and allow him to inherit all his titles and ultimately become the 18th Earl of Oxford. And certainly that would explain the symbolism between having the first 17 sonnets saying hurry up and have a baby and the 18th saying you've you've done it because the future 18th Earl of Oxford has been born. Now um, th there are a huge n number of arguments and a lot of evidence to show that this is the case and the email uh, address you've got there is a YouTube channel and there you can see a speech in which I give a very large amount of evidence to show that uh, Henry Vere, the 18th Earl of Oxford, who you see on the left there, is the natural son of uh, Henry Rothersley, the Earl of Southampton, who's on the right. And it looks from this very strange picture as though the artist uh, kind of knew this. Um, I can't see any other excuse um, for having, and there is no other picture like it where you have two Earls quite so closely seated and um, looking quite so similar. So that is some of the background to the encryption I'm going to show you um, right now. Okay, so you remember this. We've been here before. It's the 19th equal letter spacing grid of the dedication to the only begetter of these ensuing sonnets, etc., etc., etc. You will remember the fourth T has De Vere written in it. It's a rabus. Um, these sonnets all by Ever the Fourth T, and you'll remember that I made that into a capital I, and we saw Edward de Vere lies here. And then we went off to the left, and we found another rabus, which uh, was an upside-down cross, showing that he was buried in uh, the South Cross Isle of St. Peter's Church. And then we went even further left, and we found another rabus, a, a, a pictogram of Westminster Abbey, and that was telling us, really, that he was buried in... Uh, poet, what we now call Poet's Corner in Westminster Abbey. Um, if you were concentrating, which I'm sure you were, you'll have noted that I didn't seem to show anything to the right-hand side of this grid. Nothing um, really showed up from column 10 to column 19, and that's what we're going to look at now, and that's where the third um, and final encryption is hidden. Okay, first thing I'm going to do is um, take away this capital I, um, but keep a symbol of Christ. How do I do that? Well, there's one very obvious way. I'm going to turn it into a big cross like that. That's the 4T cross, or the um, cross potent, and you can see De Vere is the 4th T at the bottom of it. Um, in there, we have a perfect anagram of Heed Vere's Paternity Lie. Now, I can see you might be saying, hang on, you can probably get lots of anagrams out of that, and why do you pick that particularly? Um, well, in defence, I will say that we know that we're talking about Veer. Veer is obviously the subject of all that seems to be going on here. Um, the, the, the word Veers is all in the uh, vertical stem of that cross. Uh, the word paternity, the letters are all to be found in the horizontal stem of that cross. Lie is not even an anagram, it's just sitting there to, to plain sight. So in fact, it's only the word heed that I've had to do a bit of special pleading for and had to pick out. Um, but I would argue that that falls very much into the uh, way that these things are presented. If you remember um, the Stratford Monument, um, we have stay passenger, why goest thou by so fast, or um, read if thou canst, whom envious death hath placed within the monument. This imperative voice, which seems to be coming out from these encryptions, it's very much in line with that. Heed Veer's paternity lie, so it's kind of asking you to see if you can find out about a lie paternity lie. Now we're going to step uh, one step now to the right and I'm going to show you a phallic symbol right there. A phallic symbol, a well-known phallic symbol, a very very ancient one at that. goes right back to Egyptian times. looks like a, an upside down T with an elongated stem, a symbol of male generative uh, power. Now, what uh, justification? No, I'll actually, first of all, I'm going to say what, what is the message inside it, because that will give you a bit more confidence that what I'm doing is not complete um, Freudian fantasy. 
Um, there's a perfect anagram in there of Veer's line. Now again, it's healthy to be sceptical and be sceptical by all means, but we have to admit that a phallic symbol and a line are in some way um, connected, a symbol of male generative power. We also have to admit that um, if you look at the symbol next to it, the big cross, that if there's a lie in Veer's paternity, in the Veer family is a paternity lie, then clearly that would affect Veer's line. So we have um, a coincidence of theme between those two things. Um, we also need to look for the um, uh, Jesus Christ endorsements. If we look at the bottom, how it seems to be two sets of triple towers, clavis ad fasorum there. So that's twice Jesus seems to be saying, Yup, this is acceptable. And look at the column number. The column number is always important. And ask oneself, what the heck does the number 14 have to do with Jesus, uh, male lines, etc.? Well, again, we go to the Bible, to the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David until they were carried away into Babylon, that's to Josiah, 14 generations. And after they were carried away into Babylon unto Christ, 14 generations. So we see that um, Christ's male line is being counted in groups of 14 generations. We go to the, follow the, the preceding verse, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was thus, when as his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Um, interesting this, because why do we have the great history of Jesus' male line being counted out in 14 generations to be followed immediately by something saying, well, Jesus wasn't even descended from this line because Mary was uh, pregnant before she got together with Joseph. Remember the story, Joseph was rather upset about that and thought about casting her out, but was told by an angel not to do so. This is extremely interesting because take note of the verse numbers here, verse 17 and verse 18. What, what has this got to do with, with the Veres? I mean, Edward de Vere was the 17th Earl of Oxford. And we are smelling a problem here that the 18th Earl of Oxford was not a descendant of the 17th ancient line that goes right back to the 10th century, that he is actually the natural child of someone else, Henry Rothersley. 17 and 18 there are acting as a big clue and telling us the story. There's some parallel here between the Via line and Christ's line. Um, now, uh, some will be aware that 10 or 15 years ago, um, a very clever man called John Rollett um, discovered the name of Henry Rothersley encoded uh, on the 18th grid. So he saw it quite easily because it was um, in vertical lines. And it comes in two blocks, E off Esley. And the WR at the beginning of the line was rather separated. And he wondered why. He wondered whether it was part of something bigger. Well, it is, and that's what I'm about to show you. Um, there's Eoth Esley in two chunks, but side by side. So half the name is there, and where's the front end? Where's the WR? John Rollett said that it belonged to the first W of Wellwisher and to the first R of Adventurer. So there it is. Um, interesting because we seem to have the name Rothelsey is now not just split up for no apparent reason, it seems to be connecting the uh, phallic symbol the, of Veer's line with the 4T cross about Veer's paternity lie. It seems to be binding the two together, or is at least connected in some way to both. Now, his name, as we remember, was Henry Rothelsey, so can we find Henry? There's H.W., his initials, on either side of Veer's line. Um, and the W.R. penetrating, as it were, into the Veer's line. Interesting. Um, where's the rest of his name? Henry, remember? Well, it's here. Henry, just like with Roth, it's exactly the same thing. The name has been divided into two parts, and one part um, goes into the paternity lie, and another part is crossing over Veer's line. So both with the Christian name and with the surname, 
there seems to be connected to these two these two symbols and these two messages but everything has to happen in threes or it uh, doesn't count it's not valid so we need a third way in which Henry Rothelsey can bind these two um, these two messages now notice how the re of Henry spurs off in a diagonal line upwards to the right just above the H of Henry if you look just above the W of Riothersley, you see another word spurring off diagonally to the right. There it is. Ipse. Ipse in Latin means himself. Henry Riothersley himself. Now why on earth would the encryptor bother to go to all the trouble to put himself there? It doesn't seem to be adding anything particularly to the message. Uh, and I wouldn't think adds enormously to the burden and difficulty of making an encryption. But he's done it, so we have to ask why he's done it. I think the answer is that he wants the whole of this encryption to run from column 6 all the way to column 18 so that we learn uh, that Henry Rothelsey himself is the only begetter. You see how that title runs from column 6 to 18. So the only begetter is Henry Rothelsey himself. The only begetter of what? Of whom? Well, as you can see, we're all getting very suspicious that he's the only begetter of Henry Veer. Can we find Henry Veer here? Well, if Henry Veer is indeed the son of Henry Ruffles, he's called after him, so he shares the same Henry. So there we'll leave that Henry there, and now assume that it accounts for Henry Veer. And once again, we see that it, uh, it, it is cast partly onto the paternity lie symbol and partly on Veer's line. And can we find Veer, well there's your HV, and yes, there is Henry Veer, he's sitting right there. And so now we can be absolutely sure that Veer's line didn't mean Edward de Veer's line, this phallic symbol I keep talking about, it, it's referring to Henry Veer's line, um, and suggesting that Henry Rothelsey, the Earl of Southampton, is the only begetter of Henry Veer's line. The only begetter, therefore, one would think of, of Henry Veer. Now, we saw how the surname Rothelsey binds um, Veer's line and the paternity line symbol. Can we do the same with the surname Veer? Look how Henry Veer's surname is uh, spaced out there. You've got it's a triangle. On the bottom line you have V-R-E with an E situated above it. Exactly and precisely replicated just there. V-R-E on the bottom with E above it. The clever way of showing that the surname and the Christian name of Henry Veer, just like with Henry Rothelsey, are binding together the paternity lie and Veer's line. If we take that last E of Veer and spur off again up to the right, we have Ipse. We used it once before. We're going to use it again. In fact, we're going to use it three times. Everything happens in threes. The justification for using it for Henry Veer, you can see that it comes off the, the last E of Veer there, and it goes up to the E uh, in column 18. And, of course, he was the 18th Earl, and his label sits right next to it, ensuing son. So the only begetter, Henry Rothelsey himself, is the only begetter of the ensuing son, the son that came out of all these sonnets and persuading him to have a baby for love of me, the ensuing son being Henry Veer himself. Okay, everything has to come in threes. We know this so well now, I, I, I will never tire of saying it. Uh, so this should be a third symbol, and if there's going to be a third symbol, we can tell exactly where it's going to be, because there's a great deal of space there to the right between columns 15 and 19 with nothing in it. Um, okay, so we've had messages about Henry Veer and Henry Rothelsey. Um, where's our great friend the poet? Um, Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford. You will notice that 17 is the central column there. And you'll have known from my previous presentation that Oxford is consistently referred to by the numbers 17 and 40. We saw 1740 encoded on the Stratford Monument. We saw 1740 on the Westminster Monument. We saw 1740 occurring um, on the Sonnet's dedication page. And uh, also we found it in the first folio. So 1740 is the Earl of Oxford. So what happens if we make former cross, a little T, an upside down T, from column 
17 and row 4. That would be a 1740, would it not? So there's 1740, and that gives us one reason to suppose that is a symbol of Edward de Vere. But we're not going to get away with this unless we can find three reasons for supposing it to be a symbol of Edward de Vere. Um, we used ipse twice. Everything has to happen three times. So let's use ipse again. And yes, you'll notice ipse runs between E and O. That's the initials Edward Oxenford, as he signed himself and also as some of his poems um, were published under the initials E-O. So we've got two good reasons. We see that line Ipse running straight across that 40 cross, 1740 cross. So um, that's our second reason why we can be sure we're talking about Edward de Vere there. Uh, but yes, we need a third reason. And I stared at this for quite a long time until I saw it and it, it's actually obvious when you see it it's staring one in the face. Um, that T is an upside down T. It's slightly longer at the top than at the bottom, so it's an upside down cross. It is therefore the fourth cross, the cross of St. Peter, it's Petrine cross, and it is therefore the fourth T. And you remember the message, these sonnets all by ever the fourth T. We've been told he's the fourth T uh, uh, three times in the encryption, so this is confirmation that that emblem is Edward de Vere. It's the fourth T, 1740 cross, and it is um, marked by the initials EO himself, uh, Edward Oxenford himself. So now we're very, very confident we've found the man, so what is the message hidden inside it? And uh, the only way to ascertain it um, is you've got to find something that is relevant, has to be relevant, totally pointless. We find a message that has nothing to do with Veer's paternity lie or Veer's line. Just before I show you that, you'll remember that I, how I showed that Henry Rothelsey himself, the only begetter, um, covers in three ways those three symbols. Um, the ensuing son, Henry Veer, ditto three ways those three symbols. Um, now we're on the last one, Edward de Veer, you see the EO covers the two symbols. How, how do we have Veer on the first one, the big paternity lie? Well, you remember he is the fourth T and we had the fourth T down there, right at the beginning, with de Vere. That's the de Vere of Edward de Vere, the fourth T. So he's doing exactly the same thing, covering all three of these, these points. OK, let's read what is um, said inside that upside-down cross at the end. has to be relevant to the question. And yes, it's a very relevant indeed. It's an anagram sine prole m. That might mean nothing to some people, but anyone who has made a study of genealogy will know exactly what it means because it is extremely well-known, famous phrase, usually abbreviated to SPM, which stands for sine prole mascula, without male issue, without, without um, male descendants, legitimate descendants. Um, so there we have the answer. We heed Veer's paternity lie. The lie is quite clearly and quite obviously now uh, the fact that Henry... Uh, Veer, which shouldn't have been called Henry Veer, and he certainly shouldn't have been inheriting the titles of Oxford, because he was begotten by the only begetter himself, Henry Rothelsey, and he was the son that ensued um, after this great act of persuading, honey-tongued persuasion, um, to have a son for love of me. So that is the um, third and final encryption, and it shows you basically the theme of the first 18 sonnets, and shows you where the sonnets a heading and the starting point of them and make sense of them and that's why it is encoded into the sonnet's dedication. Okay, um, last point I'd like to make, I'll just take you back to that Westminster Abbey I showed you on the very first encryption I showed you. Look inside the cloister there and what do you see? The letter D. And that, that That's the first of the of the three things that tell you where he's buried. If you look at the first of the symbols in the encryption I've just shown you, the third encryption, yep, just there you have the word D written across it. Um, this, of course, is the, the middle encryption I showed you, the middle of the second of the three. Uh, there's only one person who's known to, if you like, sign his name or represent himself um, by a big triangle, which is the delta in Greek, by the letter D in Greek. And uh, yes, he is, of course, John D, Elizabeth's conjurer, whose hand we can see clearly in all three of these encryptions. That's all. Thank you.